All right. Um, question. What is CO2 or carbon dioxide for you? We exhale it. Is it a waste? What about it's a building block? It's a resource. So what about if I told you that we have about uh, 408 gigatons of polyethylene flying around? Nobody would believe me. No, we have it uh, as CO2, right? And so that's what we want to remove. We want to take it away from the carbon cycle. Uh, so we propose uh, this environmentally friendly, uh, as much as we can, um, a system that uses renewable energies from hydro, wind, and solar uh, with an overall carbon neutral or negative impact on the carbon chain. And that might also give us a profit. So that doesn't sound bad, right? So the problem is we have too much CO2 in the atmosphere. And in the past 200 years, we did a great deal of damage here. So if we can get rid of that and not let it back, go back to the atmosphere, that would be a great thing. So um, we want to make something that gives us a profit, all right? So uh, latest advancement in carbon chemistry is we have nanocarbons, we have graphene, we have carbon nanotubes. So if we can make them, we can access technologies that so far are just confined into the lab, right? We can have materials that are 100 times stronger than steel, like 130 gigapascal tensile strength, all right? Of course, if they were to be defectless. Uh, uh, they are uh, semiconductor at room temperature um, and thermally conductive, et cetera, et cetera. So they are also transparent and they are, in some cases they are also biocompatible. Uh, we can do some small things. We can do heat sinks, which is very important as the computing power increases. Um, we can do conductive inks and consumer products, headphones, smartphone charger. Um, in terms of lab scale, we have so many more applications that we can use with nanocarbons, okay? So uh, we are planning to tap uh, into um, uh, federal grants and uh, startup uh, funds for our first phases. Um, and of course, private capital will be welcome. Um, and on the long term, we want to reduce, uh, in general, about 15 gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere. Now, that's not all of it, but it's, it, it's going to help. Uh, what are we going to get out of it in terms of technology improvement and advancement is that we're going to improve nano, uh, nanoparticle catalysis on ceria and other metal oxide and organic synthesis as well. Why? Because we are planning to suck carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere transform it using energy from renewable sources and transform it into something that we can sell. So here is the first uh, potential solution to our problem. And it's uh, working through uh, uh, cerium uh, oxide, uh, cerium oxide uh, suspended into a liquid metal uh, that functions as the electrode and produces amorpho uh, amorphous nanocarbon. Now, uh, there will be some technical challenges here, and it's how are we going to scale it up? This is at the lab scale, and it has been shown to, show, to work pretty well. Uh, but there will be some catalyst improvement in terms of like efficiency and recovery of the catalyst. And also, can we template the feckless nanocarbons on it? Because that's the ultimate challenge, making precise nanocarbons at the atomic level that we can scale up as much as we want. Um, and then we have a more uh, aqueous friendly uh, method that we propose, um, and this is some existing literature. For example, we can do uh, semiconductor photo uh, reduction. We can uh, do a photo reduction on titanium nanoparticles. Uh, and here is basically what is going on at the chemical level. We have a functionalized electrode with a macrocycle uh, containing a metal cation. The cation is getting reduced by an electron. And then it complexes with the CO2 to form, uh, to form this carbonate here, uh, this carboxylate here. Uh, and then, upon reduction, an electron is transferred from the metal to the uh, carbon dioxide to form uh, a nucleophile. What is a nucleophile is the organic chemist's best friend. All right. Um, so, uh, which kind of market do we want to tap in this case? Is the fine chemical market, okay? Specialty chemicals and potentially if uh, this uh, process is scalable to megatons, we can also tap into polymers and resins. 
okay, because the, the, uh, the products that we're gonna get from this process are carboxylate, and we can find them in polyesters, polyamides like uh, uh, nylon, et cetera, et cetera. So here is a, a competitive analysis on the market and what we, what we offer uh, from this process. Uh, we can offer nanographenes and nanocarbons, and we can see that the price is pretty steep here. Okay, we are talking about thousands of dollars for uh, kilograms of, of, of material, if not more, 25,000 for mono, uh, monowall single carbon nanotubes. Uh, fine chemicals, of course, those are a lot cheaper, right? But we can go and offer intermediates, which are green and renewable to the pharmaceutical industry, to flavor and fragrances, and to uh, all the other niche industries that we can find in the fine chemi chemical world. Uh, how is it gonna look on the long term? The chloroalkali process is something that looks like this, giant banks of electrodes that we can pump through uh, sodium chloride from the uh, seawater and we produce sodium hydroxide and chlorine. And now I'm gonna pass the microphone to John Watkins who is gonna do the uh, more precise uh, time scale analysis. Well, it'll be different anyway. Uh, so. We had uh, initially looked at uh, building this up as an electrochemical process, and uh, I have experience in taking this from SBIR, SBIR whoop, funding. And I think uh, we'd start with a year one, you know, SBIR grants, and we'd focus on uh, determining the kinetics of these reactions, basically teasing out everything that the research paper uh, leaves out. You know, what is it, does it work in a planar system, does it work or does it only work in a you know, metal, liquid metal ball? Um, and then if that works out well, then we you know, go to phase two and then try to scale it up. I actually have the, you know, we want to get start at one gram per day an electrochemical system and then slowly take steps forward. It's been my experience that uh, uh, electrosynthetic processes do not scale in a massive quantum order of magnitude methods uh, overnight. Uh, so I think this is a reasonable uh, time scale. Uh, it's aggressive, but I think it's also doable. Uh, other than the cat catalyst, uh, there's not anything that's uh, particularly new from an electrosynthetic process. Uh, so our basic plan is just to start with uh, uh, phase one you know, research grants, just to do a proof of concept, see if it's uh, go, no go points at any one time. And after the end of that, obviously go for private investment funding um, through Series A, you know, B and C, and then finally get to uh, uh, basically a small chloralkali sized plant, which um, is not nearly as, as uh, complicated as, say, a large refinery type, uh, since we're working at regular temperatures um, and not regular pressures. So, and uh, these values aren't including what we would get from product sales. Um, since I didn't know. <laughs> right. That's right. Yep. That's good. Okay. Give it up. Great. All right. Questions. We don't. All right. So, can you go to your competitive slide? Uh, yeah. You had some. Uh, so, which is very good that you showed uh, what state of the art. Mm -hmm. I think you did. Uh, you're giving us the market. But what are you competing against, uh, uh, and what, what, what's your target? I don't see your target for price points. Uh, for, so in terms of price points, um, uh, that's still a technology that has yet to go out of the lab. So we don't really know an effective uh, uh, sort of like how much it's going to cost to develop the technology in order to make that compound. Right now we are at the lab stage. Um, so, so trying to find a high value product out yeah. of carbon dioxide, people are looking at this and I, we, we're, we're, we're not seeing any, any way out of this uh, with, the, with the way things are priced currently, but mm -hmm. maybe you have a different uh, Well, I mean, like the, I, I cannot really say about the, the end product cost, um, but for sure it's gonna go down. Um, because if we can really make um, uh, compounds like nanographenes and carbon nanotubes in ton scale every day, then the price will go down. And in this case, we will enable and we will uh, literally uh, expand the possibility in terms of like capacitors, in terms of like um, composite material. 
like in scales that were not accessible so far. It, right. it, and it's just that question that mm -hmm. uh, that phase that I want to question. You show carbon dioxide going in and nanographenes coming out. Uh, would yeah. you say a little bit more about that space sure. in between those two arrows? Uh, it's this energy, uh, how energy intensive it is, and what its yield is. Okay, uh, so um, in this case, um, Shannon. Uh, based upon the, the oh, research yeah. paper, they, were, they reported an 80% Faraday mm -hmm. efficiency, and uh, at the based on the calculation of the operating current and their reduction rates, uh, I came up with a uh, around 1.1 megawatt hour per ton. Uh, that's obviously that's just uh, pure electricity cost, so that comes out to about $26 uh, in electricity at uh, wholesale prices. Now that um, obviously leaves out capital and other things, but that's just the energy cost I recalculated from our previous But how much of that is graphene? Uh, about half, based upon, that's based upon the, the literature report, mm -hmm. and that's obviously lab scale and not optimized uh, for that. The other, the remainder came out as uh, carbon monoxide, which is less than ideal. So that's obviously a phase one uh, catalyst investigation also. I, don't know. I mean, so you, here you assume that all the oxygen goes into two, not carbon monoxide. Yeah. Um, well, uh, if some of it goes to carbon monoxide, in both cases there will be some uh, potential uh, sort of um, spurious reduction, right? Um, you could still use body to get out of that. <laughs> Yeah, um, we can also, in theory, separate it back and reuse it like in formulation processes. So once an industrial uh, setup is set up, then we can recycle whatever byproducts we get, put it back, or eventually divert it into a different uh, production line, let's say. I don't know if it, that's a correct term. Um, so you listed 220 tons of graphene and 15 million of pine chemicals. Yeah. That's a relatively small scale relative to you know, a thousand gigatons that we're trying to pull out of the yes. atmosphere. Is the idea here to just um, make something profitable so and then work on larger volume? This is materials? based on, on present uh, demand. So this is 220 tons of graphene, what we will need in order to satisfy the demand at the current asking. Um, so that's, that's the most reliable data that we have currently. We cannot. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Howard. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. Thank you. Patrick, if I could ask you to the stage, and we'll be setting up for the next presentation.